is our last week of our sermon series, What Would Jesus Undo? You know, we've talked about several things. We talked about what our view of repentance is. We talked about hollow, just worship that was empty. We talked about hypocrisy. We talked about being prideful. This week, we're going to close it up with something that may offend you. It may convict you. I don't know what it may do. I just pray that it does something good to help you. Um, and it's our last week in that. And we built this message, what would Jesus, sermon, what would Jesus undo, based off of the famous phrase we hear what? WWJD. What would? Come on now. Y'all better get alive in here this morning. What would? Jesus. Have you ever wondered where that came from? I did, so I looked it up. <laughs> In 1819, there was a book wrote, In His Steps. And in this book, the author wrote a passage about being in his steps of what would he do in this situation, or what would he do in that situation. And they say about 100 years later, somebody got the brilliant idea to get a bracelet and say, WWJD. That's where that story came from. And I was like, you know what? I enjoy stuff like that. I'm always seeking to find things. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I really enjoy that. So what I want to do is to start my message off. I want to tell a story. But before I do that, I want to pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Lord, any attack that the enemy has sent to bring confusion Lord, to bring an unsettledness. Lord, anything that the enemy would use to bring destruction to this service today, we break its power with the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask you, Lord, that you empower me, Lord, to share your word today. Help me, Holy Spirit. Lord, to share my heart that you put inside me for your people. Lord, I ask that you increase and I decrease. All of you, Lord, and none of me. And Lord, no matter what happens in this world, no matter, Lord, if our prayers are not answered, you are still good. And you will always be good. In your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So I was about 20 years old, maybe 21. I can't remember exactly. That seemed like an eternity ago. I had a job and I really didn't make that much money. Um, I still live with my parents and you would think I would have a lot, but I just didn't. I blew it all the time. But uh, I decided that I wanted to save up some money. And I saved up some money for a reason because I had a, a pastor man that I heard him say he wanted something very bad and I said you know what I'm going to save up this money and I'm going to get this gift for him because I appreciate what he done for me man he was a is a great leader I love him to death I said you know what I'm going to save and so what I would do I would skip lunches I would just take my lunch money and I'd save it till I was able to buy this gift for him and let me tell you what it was some of you may think wow that's crazy to buy that but how many gun fans do I have in here? People like guns, right? Praise God for that. Some of you other people, I don't like guns. Well, just, well, we won't go there. Stop. Um, so there is a thing called a crimson laser grip. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Well, basically, you can put a grip on a pistol, and it shoots a laser. And you pinpoint, you can shoot. These things are like four or $500. So for me, that was a lot of money. So I saved up. And I got it. And I was so excited. I wrapped it up, and I was going to bring it to my leader to church that Sunday. And uh, I waited till after the service. <coughs> excuse me. And uh, he come up to me, and I said, hey, man, I just want to tell you, thank you for everything you've done for me. I've saved up some money, and I bought you something very special. And they took it, and it was like, oh, thanks so much. And then we talked for a minute, and I noticed that he set the gift down on the table right beside him in the foyer. And we talked for a few minutes. Well, then we got distracted and we walked off. 
Well, the next day, I came up to the church and I wanted to ask him how he liked the gift. Well, I come in the front door and I noticed the gift was still sitting on that table. Yeah, some of you mamas went, oh, thank you for that. And it broke my heart. I was devastated. I was like, man, this was the very best that I could have gave. And it devastated me. Here come the haymakers, so get ready. Jesus left heaven, came to this earth, performed miraculous miracles, was betrayed by his best friends, was beaten, crucified, died, and rose again to give us a gift. And we go on day in and day out and we don't even think about this gift. So, what would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo spiritual indifference. Lukewarm Christian. You're indifferent. You're not on one side. You're not on the other. You're just in the middle. You know, <clears throat> one thing I know about this generation that we're all in right now, I've noticed that through my life, we're, I want to call us the mm generation. You know what I'm talking about? Mm, right? For instance, how you doing today, Miss Carol? Mm. There you go. Thanks for going with me on that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you know, Miss, does God love you? Mm. Don't you know that you have a purpose? Mm. Wes, didn't you know that Alabama was the greatest college football team of all time? Mm. Yeah, I beat you to it. I beat you to it. Mm. Yeah, beat you to it. Mm. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo indifference. <clears throat> Jesus wrote seven letters to seven different churches in the Bible. You can find these seven churches in Revelations. And there was one church that Jesus wrote to that battled with a spiritual indifference. And <clears throat> this church was called Laodicea. I think I'm saying that correctly. Laodicea. And it was a powerful city. This city, though, before this, had an earthquake hit it, and it about demolished it. Okay? And they rebuilt it. And when they rebuilt it, Jesus wrote the letter to them because the city was built and it was extravagant. Man, there were stadiums. They had huge malls. I mean, it was the most extravagant thing you can see. Probably pretty much like something like you see in Dubai or something like an extravagant Las Vegas or something like that. It was very powerful. The only problem is, is they had a water problem. They were, water supply was inadequate. So what they did was they built two ducks, aqueducts. One from the mountains. And uh, <coughs> how do I say this right? Kosalea, I got it in my notes, and I was just not, just not that good at it. But Kosalea, and it was known for its cold water. Okay? They would take cold water, and they would use it for certain things. It had purpose. Then there was the hot springs in Hierapolis. And they would use the hot springs for medicinal purposes. They would take baths with it. They would wash clothes with it. And when these two ducks, they would pump them in. When these two ducks come to let Osea, they would meet in the middle. And when they met in the middle, the water mixed. And it wasn't hot. And it wasn't cold. It was lukewarm. And it was dirty. And it was filthy, 
and they couldn't use it for anything. It did not have a purpose. And they had this water problem. So Jesus, being the master communicator that he is, he writes them a letter so that they would understand it. And they would know this because he would use words that they would understand. Let's look at it. Revelations chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. And this is what he has to say about them. He says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one of the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, what will he do? I will spit you out of my mouth. If you take that last verse, the spit you out my mouth, I looked it up in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> the Greek. It actually means to be sick to the stomach, to puke or vomit. So what Jesus is really telling these people is that you are lukewarm and you make me sick to my stomach. All that I've done for you and you don't even use it for the right way. That makes me sick to my stomach. So, I have a big idea, and I'm going to go ahead and pull it up now, if we can. And my big idea is this. Lukewarm people don't just break his heart. They make him puke. And I want you to know that. God wanted me to share that today. So, how do we know if we are living this lukewarm life? How do we know? Well, I got some things that <clears throat> I want to share with you today. I want to build it first. So let's talk about two causes of spiritual indifference. What are two things that cause it? The first thing is self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. I just read you verse 15 and 16. I want you to read with me the next verse, what Jesus says about this. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They thought they had it all. They were self-sustaining, self-sufficient. And they didn't even know. They didn't even know that they were naked and poor. This message has really broke me. And I'll tell you why later on in my message. But I want you to hear my heart today. And I want you to know, man, that Jesus wants you to be free. He don't want you to live a lukewarm life. He wants you to live with purpose. Some of you I've talked to and I've heard you say this, you know, Pastor, man, I got it. I'm good. <laughs> I got Netflix. I got a car. Hey, I got to own my own Snuggie at the house. Self-sufficient. The second thing is distractions of this world distractions of this world can cause us to be indifferent <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard or not but there's a famous story in the Bible about Jesus he talked about casting seeds on rocky soil or casting them into good ground or cast them into thorns in Mark chapter 4 verse 19 Jesus says something, and I want to pick that up on that if we can. <clears throat> Give him a second. I'll go without him. Here's what Jesus talks about. Jesus talked about rocks. And he said if this seed, meaning the word, was thrown onto this rocky soil, that it would literally choke the life out of the word. You know, when I, I use this verse and I share this with you because of this, 
a lot of us, we're living that life today. Worship. We're living the life that talks about in this verse about, hey, we don't do it intentionally. We don't intentionally go through life. Here's what happens. We have kids get sick. The car breaks. Something happens and it begins to choke the word out of us. And we just go through life. Hey, I'm guilty of that. I had that happen to me. I've had it happen to me this week. Well, I would pray, I would read my word, and something would come up and it would distract me. It would distract me. And it would choke the life out of what God's word says. Then I find myself snapping at my wife. But then you may say, you know, God, I still love you. I'm just tired. Who's ever said that before? God, I love you. I'm just tired. What do we see all over this earth right now? Especially in our country. What do we see? We see a lot of people with just a little bit of Jesus. We see a lot of people, just a little bit of him. Mm. Just enough to say, I'm going to make it to heaven. Just enough to make me feel better about myself. Just enough to come to church. I'm not going to worship or serve. Coming to church was enough. Lukewarm people not only break his heart, they make him sick to his stomach. He wants to puke. So, how do I know if I'm living this life? Some of you may just already know. But in case you don't know, I hadn't been in ministry a long time. Been in it for a few years. But through my years, I've seen some things. And I wrote down six things that I've seen that's a sure sign that you are going through this course of a lukewarm believer. Six ways to know. Number one, you're more concerned with impressing people than living for God. You're more concerned with impressing people than living for God. Look at my nice shoes. Look at my nice shirt. Look at my nice hair. Do you see my brand new truck outside? We are more concerned with people than we are living for God. Number two, we're obsessed with life on earth rather than eternity. It's all about me and I want it now. Things, 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 and things we are more concerned with than eternity with Him. If you're more concerned with getting stuff now and wanting things, 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 and things, pretty good sign. Number three, this is a good one. We rationalize sin and live without truly fearing God. In our culture, we don't rationalize it. We just rename it. I got a few of them I want to give you. Oh, I'm not in adultery. I just had an affair. Sounds better. Miss Carol, I'm not lying. I just stretched the truth a little bit. Miss Carl, I don't have a porn addiction. It's adult entertainment. Oh, I'm not an addict. I just use this stuff. It's a nerve calmer for me. It relaxes me. We rationalize it. If you find yourself in that place, it's a good sign. You're lukewarm. Number four, we believe in Jesus, but rarely share our faith. 
We believe in Jesus, but we rarely talk about him. I don't want anybody to raise their hands. I'm not here to embarrass you. I just want you to think real quick. When's the last time I told somebody about Jesus? You know what? I'm not even going to ask because I already know. Probably most of the room would say, "Ah, I don't know. You know why? This is not 100% guarantee for everybody. But if you think about it, it's because you really don't believe the gospel. Because I'm going to tell you something. Miss Polo, when I believe something, I talk about it. I talk about it. Here's what I believe. I believe that you, Polo, you can take an avocado and cut it and put it in rice, and it's good, brother. It definitely. And he taught me that. So when me and Polo get together and we talk about food, I say, you going to have avocado and rice over there? Because I believe it. When's the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? Number five, we only turn to God when we need him. Rather than seeking him daily, we seek him when it benefits us. I had somebody tell me this one time. They say, you know, we treat God like a toolbox. When we need a tool for a job, we'll go in the toolbox and get it. And then when we're done, we'll put it back up. Is that what he is to you? Is he just there for when you need him? If you find yourself in this, maybe a good sign. And number six, we're not much different from this world. We entertain ourselves with the same things. We watch the same filthy movies. We listen to the same music. We spend our money the same way. We raise our kids the same way. Without even knowing it, not even intending it, we wake up living in a life of indifference. Lukewarm. Just like that. We're in it. I want to be honest with you. I want to tell you a story. This week has been a very difficult week for me, especially when it comes time for me preparing this message. And let me tell you why it's been difficult for me. It's been difficult for me because, I don't know if you know, a few weeks ago, the tornado that came through here, it came through my backyard, tore my fence down, messed some roof damage up, and gave me some pool damage. And... The insurance guy came and he said, I need estimates. So this whole week, I've been focused on getting the fence guy out there, getting the roofer out there, getting the pool fixed, that I did not give the time that I should have been given to prepare a message that would be life changing, would change someone's life. I hate that about myself. It took my focus away. Here's what's so crazy about it. The fence, I've got it tacked up, it's fine. The roof, there really ain't no damage to it. The pool is perfectly fine. But I allowed it. stupid stuff to take focus off a hill. It could happen to any of us at any moment. There's a purpose for the cold water. There's a purpose for the hot water. But in the middle Hey, ain't no purpose. 
You want to go to church today? Eh. You want to be a part of a connect group and sign up outside today? Man. You want to use the gifts that God's blessed you with? Man. You want to be a generous giver today? Man. You want to lead someone to Christ today? Man. I couldn't because I was so focused on just stupid stuff this week. What would Jesus undo? He would undo indifference. He would come here and undo a lukewarm believer. So, what do I do to reignite my passion and my fire for the Lord? What do I do? Normally, when somebody asks me that, I would tell them this. Spend time with him. Read his word. Put on some worship music. Pray. These are awesome things to do. Today, though, I'm going to tell you something that I believe is life-changing. And it may be one of the best things I've said all year. And that is this. What do I do to reignite my passion? One point. And that is this. Every day, do something that requires faith. Every day, do something that requires faith. Not Monday, then Thursday, every day. Do something that requires faith. Got some examples for you. Maybe you'll stand up for somebody this week. Maybe you'll be generous and become a giver. Maybe you'll sign up after church today on a team and serve like the children's ministry. Maybe you'll choose to forgive that person that you've been holding on to for so long. Maybe you'll volunteer at our next connect group and say, hey, I'll pray out loud. Faith. Maybe you'll pray for something that's impossible for man, but it's possible with the Lord. Here's what I want you to know. My favorite scripture of all time is Hebrews 11, especially verse 6. And here's why. Because it tells us a key to pleasing God. It starts off this way. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So we have to have faith to please Him. I love what James says. James says, faith without works is dead. So we got to do something. If you find yourself in a life that you may feel like you're lukewarm right now or you're just going through the motions, do something every day that requires faith. Put your work into action and do something. Witness to somebody on the job site. Some of us in here, this may require great faith and some it don't. The next time your wife says something to you and you don't like it, walk away in that moment instead of telling her how insufficient she is as a wife. Man, we just dog quiet in here right now, ain't we? I done stepped on somebody. That may require faith. But I can tell you this, there's fruit from that. And it's not bad fruit, it's good fruit. Because I'm going to tell you, everyone in this room right now, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you this to be a good leader to you. You don't want to stand before him one day 
and him look at you and say, you make me sick. I'm about to vomit. No, we all want to hear the same thing, don't we? Well done, good and faithful servant. What would Jesus undo? He would undo indifference. A lukewarm believer. Why would he do that? Because it breaks his heart. Because he died. He paid the price. He gave us a gift. And we left it sitting on that table. He says, well, appreciate what you've done. I'll come back to it whenever. We do this every stinking day when we don't serve him, when we don't worship him, when we get on our jobs and we act like the world does. If you're on your job and nobody has labeled you as the weird Christian guy or the Christian dude on the block, I would question that. If you're labeled as one of the guys, I would step back and look at that. Because the word that I read tells us to be separate from this world and to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our mind, to turn away from it. If you're living a life of sin, turn away from that sin. Do something that requires faith. Turn away from it. would Jesus undo? He would undo indifference. Amen? Stand to your feet.